while we go. Um, okay. And and then and then in the end again anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fine. So we do that. Yes, and I will I will explain a little bit how to proceed. It's now eleven. Oh, yeah, getting few more people. Good. So, uh, by the way, um, no particular uh, limit in time. I mean, so whatever you have oh, planned, okay. if, if you, if there is no a strict limit. Okay, uh, yeah, so don't, don't you worry if, uh, if you overflow the time or if you make it too short, doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, I feel. Uh, yeah, I planned for this uh, one hour slot and to allow some questions in the end, but that's okay. Then that I can go relaxed in some. Uh, some... That's okay. I think, uh, yeah, it's 11 past now. But let's go for it. Anyway, I am going to have a couple of minutes in, in just saying small things. So, okay. So, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us to uh, this uh, new this new delivery issue of the QTI lecture program. And today we are happy to host Felix Wagner from the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Actually, from uh, you, you are working, if I understood well, uh, uh, directly in the Happy. Uh, ah, High yeah, Energy Physics, Physics yeah. Institute, mm -hmm. yeah, where you are doing your PhD. So now, before uh, giving the floor to Felix, uh, let me just remind you of uh, a couple of points. Uh, one is that we are recording, as you have noticed by now, because you have to accept it. We are recording this lecture. So in the event that uh, either you want to replay or maybe even more useful that you, have, you know of colleagues that couldn't make it today to the live presentation, uh, just know that uh, this presentation is going to be uh, uploaded into the Indico website where you have found the reference for this lecture uh, and you can pl play it again offline uh, at your at your ease. Um, another thing I didn't check with Felix, but if he offers me a copy of the slides, no obligation, but if, uh, if I get a copy of the slides, uh, don't you worry, it, we will put it also in the same place, so you will have it available. Um, and then, uh, just checking with Felix, please feel comfortable at uh, raising your questions as, the, as uh, the talk goes. Now, my suggestion is instead of raising the questions orally to interrupt Felix, uh, make a sign in the, in the chat and I will keep an eye so Felix can concentrate on the talk. But uh, uh, if, if you want to have a question, I will just keep an eye on the, on the chat and then uh, mention this to Felix when it is an appropriate moment. Um, another, um, as, yeah, I don't know if in the audience, uh, just to remind you, or maybe for the first time that you hear that, if it is the first time that you join to this series of lectures, uh, this uh, scheme is foreseen for uh, young researchers in particular, not only, but uh, in particular for young researchers like Felix, to have opportunities to expose your work. So if any of you is interested in, in exposing also your work in the area on, of quantum technologies, please feel comfortable again to uh, contact us. There is an email address that it is uh, in the Indico pointer. Uh, it is quantum-edu at CERN.ch. But anyway, if you, you don't need to write it down, uh, it is something that you can find also in the Indico link. So if you are interested in uh, exposing your work like Felix is going to do this morning, feel comfortable to contact us and we can arrange uh, a, a, a moment which is convenient for you to present. With all this blah, blah, we have had the, the time to have more people joining us. And with this, I give the floor to, to Felix who will just uh, delight us <laughs> with his work. So Felix, is your is your your chance now? Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you for the introduction and also thank you for the uh, invitation. And then I will share my uh, slides. Okay, perfect. So um, I will talk today about uh, super uh, the, the technology of superconducting thermometers and the application uh, for the direct detection of light uh, dark matter. Um, and I will start with the uh, general motivation of um, direct dark matter searches and the uh, technology. Uh, and then, since this is a lecture, we will make a deep dive into the theory and descriptions uh, of these devices. Uh, and in the end, we will conclude with some current uh, topic topics uh, of research and also with the relations of this technology uh, to other quantum sensors. Okay, with that. Um, 
let's start. So today we are in the situation that we observe an overwhelming gravitational evidence uh, for the existence of non-luminous, stable, cold, non-baryonic, and therefore dark uh, matter uh, in our universe. And just to uh, name the three most prominent sources of evidence, uh, so in the cosmic microwave background, we see fluctuations uh, of a size uh, that is only that can only exist uh, if there is a type of matter uh, that feels a gravitational pull, but no radiation counter pressure. Um, in the middle here, you can see the famous bullet cluster, uh, where the centers of gravity and the centers of baryonic matter, here depicted with this uh, blue and red clouds, uh, are in a severe mismatch. Um, and finally, uh, all throughout uh, the universe, we observe uh, rotation curves of galaxies where the uh, observed uh, rotation curve uh, severely mismatches the expected rotation curve from uh, the visible matter. Uh, with all of that, uh, we know uh, that about 85% of all matter in our universe is dark matter. And there are many candidates for particles that could uh, describe this dark matter. So among them generalized WIMPs and axions and others. Uh, but there are also non-particle theories. And generally, um, none of these theories uh, has been experimentally confirmed to date. So the mass scale of a hypothetical dark matter particle is wide open. Uh, and the experimental hunt for measuring dark matter particle uh, is therefore on. And now, how does this work? Uh, one way to perform such dark matter experiments is direct detection. There we use the fact that luckily along the, uh, the solar circle, uh, we have a non-null dark matter abundance. That means if you put the target on Earth uh, and you measure sensitive enough, then you expect uh, to measure this dark matter particle scattering in your target. Um, and to give you a feeling of how much dark matter we expect, so how many dark matter particles we expect to be around us, um, for a dark matter particle mass of uh, one GeV, we would, would expect roughly uh, in every cup of coffee at the point in time uh, to have one dark matter particle. So there are quite many of them around. Um, and uh, if you do an experiment uh, like that, where you want to directly measure the scattering of a dark matter particle in your target, uh, then of course the statements that you can make about uh, the existence of dark matter depend uh, on your assumed mass of this particle uh, and also on the uh, interaction cross-section uh, of the dark matter particle with your target. Um, and uh, if you make a few reasonable assumptions, uh, namely that these, dark, these particles uh, would majorly scatter with your nucleus, uh, with the nuclei uh, in your target, um, and that this would be an elastic scattering, then we can calculate the expected scattering rate in the target. And to depict this, I plotted here a couple of uh, expected uh, scattering spectra, uh, depending on the deposited recoil energy in your target. And what we can see on the left uh, of this plot is that the uh, expected recoil energy uh, grows uh, with, the, uh, with the mass of your dark matter particle, or uh, the other way around um, for very light particles, you expect only very small recoil energies. Um, and on the right side, we can see that uh, the expected recoil energy um, does also grow uh, the lighter your target nucleus is. And uh, what we can see here is a straight line, uh, the currently best achieved um, recoil uh, thresholds uh, for, these, uh, for these direct detection experiments. And um, therefore, in practice, uh, so in, in practice, it's easier to reach a low uh, recoil uh, energy threshold uh, with a light uh, target, so with a relatively small target. Uh, therefore, in practice, we have a trade-off, namely that the experiments that look for um, heavy dark matter particles or above uh, several GeV particle mass, uh, that they majorly use large targets to uh, collect a large exposure and also heavy nuclei. And experiments that uh, want to hunt these light dark matter particles use light targets, uh, low energy thresholds, 
uh, and light nuclei for these searches. Um, so, and we can quantify these results from direct detection experiments in terms of uh, exclusion limits in this parameter space. So since no um, conclusive dark matter signal was measured today, we can only uh, draw, draw these lines uh, where we tested the parameter space and where we can exclude the dark matter exists. Uh, and this dark matter, um, so this parameter space is in one dimension, the dark matter particle mass and in the other dimension, uh, the cross section. And we can see here two regimes where two different technologies uh, dominate these uh, results, namely for masses, for particle masses uh, above uh, roughly 2 GeV, um, time projection chambers with liquid noble gases uh, reach the best sensitivity. So there are experiments like Xenon or LZ uh, or Darkside. And for lighter masses, so especially below one G um, particle mass, uh, cryogenic calorimeters with superconducting thermometers reach the best sensitivity. This is mostly become, because they can reach these low energy thresholds uh, that are required uh, to make, to even expect to measure some dark matter particle scattering in this uh, mass regime. Um, now to uh, go more into the direction how this works. So why can these experiments uh, measure this very low, um, this very low um, uh, energy recoils. Uh, we have to take a look at uh, what detection channels there actually are in this type of low energy detectors. And uh, we can here uh, separate three different signal channels that can be measured, um, namely in the particle recoil. Uh, in the particle recoil in the scintillating targets, um, the recoil would produce phonons that can be collected with some uh, phonon detectors. In a, uh, uh, in a recoil in a semiconducting target or in certain um, liquids or gases, uh, electron hole pairs are created, which can also be measured, uh, for instance, by applying a voltage and uh, drifting these free electrons uh, in some direction. Um, but always in the particle scattering, uh, you produce some uh, vibrations in the target, in the case of a crystal, some lattice vibrations, which we call them phonons. And uh, in, in fact, the largest share of, recoil, of the recoil energy is usually deposited in uh, these phonons. So if you have a means of measuring these phonons directly, um, then this gives us, uh, gives us uh, relatively, so this gives us a good accessibility of this, um, of this recoil, of this deposited recoil energy. Um, and also, uh, this gives us a particle independent energy scale. And what I mean by that is that the, uh, the, the, the amount of phonons produced or the energy deposited in phonons uh, does not strongly depend on the interaction type, namely if the uh, recoil was with the nuclei of the target or with the electrons of the target. While in um, electron hole pair creation, as in, in um, or in scintillation, um, this usually depends strongly uh, on this interaction type. And often experiments use then uh, two of these signal channels to discriminate between different types um, of particle recoils. Um, but now the question is, uh, how do we actually measure these phonons? And here, uh, our technology of superconducting thermometers comes into play. So a superconducting thermometer is a small superconducting thin film that is deposited uh, on a target. In this case, we'll talk about target crystals. Uh, so on a target crystal. Um, and the temperature of this uh, whole device is then, um, is then fine-tuned such that the superconducting film is exactly in its transition uh, between a superconducting and a normal conducting state. Uh, and what this means is, if, like you can see here uh, in this uh, plot in the center, that a small temperature fluctuation uh, causes a very large fluctuation of the resistance uh, of this film. And here, this is an example uh, of a tungsten film. Tungsten has transition temperatures around 50 millikelvin. Uh, here, um, for only a very small temperature fluctuation, we would measure a very large uh, resist resistance fluctuation. If we operate this uh, superconducting film, then in a low noise and squid-based readout circuit, uh, we can reach with that uh, thermometer that is sensitive to micro Kelvin temperature fluctuations. Um, now this thermometer, when a particle 
uh, recoil uh, happens uh, inside this crystal. Um, this uh, produces finally some heat in the crystal, but also in the uh, in the thermometer, um, and produces a temperature increase. Um, and with this technology, uh, we can reach sensitivity, so we can reach recoil energies down to only 10 electron volt uh, recoil energies. So this technology was developed in uh, the mid 90s and since then continuously improved uh, for dark matter searches by experiments uh, among them, most notably the CREST and the CDMS uh, experiment. And at this point, it's maybe also very nice to look at, uh, to look at these devices, how they look in the real world. Uh, so here on the left side, we have a detector model from the CREST 3 experiment. And what we can see here, this milky uh, whitish crystal, uh, this is a calcium tungstate target crystal. And on this crystal deposited, uh, there is this superconducting thermometer film. Um, on the down here, we can see a, a way, so on the side here, a wafer detector uh, from a current run of the uh, CREST experiment, uh, there the target is uh, made of silicon. Uh, and here you can again see this uh, superconducting film. And on the right, uh, we can see a detector from the super CDMS CPT experiment. This is a much larger wafer. Here we can also see that the type of how these um, thermometers are in detail manufactured can differ. Uh, so in the case, in this case, the super CDMS experiment uses here a much larger uh, area of aluminum phonon collectors. And uh, in just a bit, uh, we'll talk more about this type of uh, collectors. Okay, with that, uh, let's look a bit more into the details of the physics that happens here in the sensor. Um, when a particle recoil happens in this crystal, um, the particle recoils, uh, so we assume that this particle recoils uh, with the nucleus, uh, with the nucleus in the target, and this produces a, a large population of high energy phonons, namely in this case, optical phonons. Uh, optical phonons are a phonon mode uh, with much higher energy. Um, but these optical phonons, um, they don't travel very far in this crystal. So they exist only relatively so localized around the position of the recoil uh, because they down convert in the lower energy phonons very fast, namely on the time scale of nanoseconds. And if up after this uh, initial down conversion, we end up with a large population of acoustic phonons uh, of about an energy of about half the EBI frequency in this material. And within uh, several microseconds, these acoustic phonons fill the whole target crystal uniformly. Um, and then they thermalize, so they down convert further to thermal ph phonons of which we can then think as just heat. Uh, and they thermalize mostly due to processes, namely the electron phonon interaction in this superconducting film and surface scattering in the crystal. Um, and now it depends on the how this device is in detail manufactured, uh, which share of this uh, initial deposited energy thermalizes in the superconducting film, so in the thermometer, and which share um, thermalizes in the crystal. And we call this share um, the parameter epsilon, so share epsilon of this recoil energy um, ends up as heat in the superconductor and the, the remainder, the share one minus epsilon ends up as heat uh, in the crystal. And if we take all this and uh, put it together with some standard methods from electrical engineering, we can in fact um, derive a system of differential equations that mathematically describes uh, the sensor type. Uh, to do this, uh, we consider the two, um, the two main, so the two dominating heat capacities in the system, namely the photonic system of the crystal, uh, which is a, a non-metal, um, and the electronic system of the uh, thermometer film. Um, and we connect them uh, with heat capacities and uh, also with uh, thermal couplings and connect them also uh, to a heat bath. Um, and this we can then put with the heat equation, we can put this into a, or a kind of collapsed heat equation. We can put this uh, into a system of differential equations and we can in this system also include the uh, electrical differential equation that describes this readout circuit. 
Um, and with that, uh, we can already do some calculations of the expected uh, detector response uh, for such a device. Um, and in fact, this expected response for a small energy deposition, like you expect it from a low energy particle scattering or, or light dark matter. Uh, so this we can simplify the system and solve it analytically. And we end up uh, with an equation that has three major parameters, um, namely three time constants, out of which one is the thermalization time, the effective thermalization time um, of these phonons. Uh, one is the thermal relaxation time of our superconducting film. Um, and the third one is the thermal relaxation time of uh, the crystal. Um, and as you can see here in this equation is that uh, two, two large components um, appear in this solution, out of which one is caused uh, by the thermalization of the phonons in the superconducting film, and the other is caused by the thermalization of the phonons in the crystal. And if we fill in some meaningful values for all these um, parameters and plot uh, this detector response, uh, we can see that the the measured detector response from such a particle re recoil is a two component pulse, uh, where for typical devices, this first component, uh, which comes from the, um, the thermalization of the R-thermal phonons in the, uh, in the superconductor directly, uh, is the dominating component that also, um, that also, uh, that also gives us the sensitivity of this device. Yeah, and for uh, comparison, uh, to show you uh, uh, how these pulses really look like when you measure them, this is from the paper where I used these parameters from um, a pulse uh, that was measured. Okay, and now um, one could in fact uh, say now a lot about how to calculate all these physical parameters, um, but I don't want to go into that much of a detail. Um, and rather later on, we'll uh, look at some uh, practical scaling laws. So maybe what we can um, take away uh, from this slide here is um, that this, we assume that this thermalization of the phonons happens on an exponential time scale. Um, this is equivalent to saying that we assume that there is a, a monochromatic phonon distribution in the crystal, uh, which is probably not exactly this case uh, in reality, but which is a, a practically in practice a very good approximation. Um, and that uh, all of these thermal couplings and heat capacities uh, are either dominated by a photonic system or electronic system. And there are some um, models to uh, reliably uh, calculate that. Uh, so especially these heat capacities can be calculated quite reliably. Um, for the thermal couplings, they depend a lot on the details of how this how a device is manufactured. So in practice, one usually takes some measured values from uh, similar devices um, if one wants to estimate some sensitivity of a new device. Uh, and all of these quantities depend strongly on the temperature uh, of operation. Okay, with that, uh, let's look a bit into the sensitivity um, of these devices. So what are now the crucial quantities that um, determine the sensitivity of a, this superconducting thermometer type um, detector? And as we saw before, that uh, the R-thermal part of the pulse shape, namely the, um, the temperature increase that is produced by phonons that thermalize directly in the superconducting film, um, is the, uh, the major factor that determines the sensitivity. And we can approximate in an optimized device, we can approximate this R-thermal uh, pulse shape with the collection efficiency, so this parameter epsilon, um, and the deposited energy uh, in, in the particle recoil. Um, but then the heat capacity of this superconducting film so it's inversely proportional to the heat capacity in the superconducting film, which kind of makes sense if this is a larger piece of film, then you need more energy um, to heat it up. Um, and there is one technology uh, that was kind of a game changer in the past uh, couple of years, decades, um, that to uh, significantly amplify this uh, collection efficiency and with that the sensitivity of the device. Um, this is called a phonon collector. And I have it depicted up here. So what we see here is uh, this tungsten layer, which we use as the 
superconducting thermometer. Uh, we operate the whole device in a, uh, within the transition of the tungsten, but then we cover a large area of this tungsten with aluminum, and aluminum has a much higher transition temperature. So at the operation temperature, this aluminum film is already um, is already fully superconducting. And due to the so-called uh, proximity effect, uh, the tungsten that is covered here by aluminum is also pulled uh, into a superconducting state. Now, a super, the heat capacity of a super, superconductor, or the heat capacity of a metal, metal in its superconducting state is suppressed exponentially um, compared to, to its normal conducting state. Uh, and therefore, what happens when this, so therefore this does not significantly, this tank, this aluminum covered tungsten part does not significantly contribute to the total heat capacity um, of the thermometer. Um, but what, what happens uh, if we have this R thermal, this high energy phonons uh, scattering in this uh, superconducting film is um, that we break, um, we break copper pairs here. And these broken copper pairs are also called uh, Bogoliubov quasi particles, and they travel diffusively in the superconducting film until at some point they reach this uncovered tungsten film, which is in transition and deposits their energy there. Uh, so by that, uh, we can kind of in increase uh, the amount of um, collected R thermal phonons in our sensor uh, without increasing the heat capacity. Um, now, talking about the sensitivity of such devices, uh, we also need to think, we not only need to think about the um, strength of reaction um, or to particle recoils, uh, but we also need to uh, compare this with the omnipresent sensor noise in these devices. Um, and for that, there are also models to predict this noise. Uh, namely, we take again our uh, our system of differential equations that we established a few slides before. Uh, and if we solve the system for small fluctuations of power and uh, voltage in the reader circuit, if we solve the system in Fourier space, uh, we can derive a kind of transition matrix uh, that gives us the expected noise fluctuations from fundamental power and voltage fluctuations uh, in our system. And um, there are mainly four um, well-studied and well-understood sources of noise uh, in these devices, namely the electrical Johnson noise, which appears in each resistor uh, in this readout circuit, then the thermal, also called phonon noise, um, that happens in the, uh, in the thermal coupling between the PS and the heat path, um, then the white um, or frequency independent squid noise, which is decoupled from this reader circuit. And um, one prominent noise source is the so-called excess 1 over F noise. Um, this is an intrinsic excess uh, in the superconducting film that is probably caused by the uh, by some fundamental um, fundamental properties of superconductivity, but that is not very well understood um, until today. So this is not reliably, pre reliably predictable, but has to be extracted um, from measurements. Um, and in fact, this is not the only um, excess noise source that appears in this type of devices, um, but there are several intrinsic excess noises that can only be heuristically described um, with, the, uh, with the current models. Um, one of them is internal thermal fluctuation noise. This is a kind of well understood noise source, and this just comes from the fact that in reality, this, um, um, this superconducting film uh, is not collapsed to one point in space, but it is a um, spatially extended uh, object and therefore ex uh, consists of many small heat capacities that are with each other thermally coupled. Um, but there are also a series of noise sources um, that are where the fundamental origin is not very well understood yet. Um, so they um, uh, observe some excess electrical noise, then this already mentioned uh, 1 over F noise, and also type of telegraph or um, jump noise. Um, and possibly this, um, so possible sources for this noise are some either non equilibrium effects or some fundamental effects of superconductivity or the electron phonon um, interaction. 
So, however, putting all of this um, together, um, we came um, based on some, if we, if we take the data from some measurements, uh, we can build a, a simulation of such a, a detector. And for this lecture, I did this uh, to give a few uh, more uh, practical examples how this um, how these devices uh, look like if you build them and operate them. Uh, so I used from this uh, original reference of the of the model. Um, I used the, the studied heat capacities and thermal couplings. Um, if you combine this with the models, then you can simulate uh, such pulses um, as they would appear in the real experiment. This is what you see here on the uh, right upper plot. Uh, and here I've plotted the uh, approximation of the superconducting transition curve. Um, here it is to note that for this reference, the, um, was used the Iridium Gold B layer TES, uh, which has a very wide uh, transition curve, namely from uh, some some temperature slightly above 100 millikelvin down to uh, down to 20 millikelvin and below. Uh, in modern devices uh, that are optimized for sensitivity, um, we would we usually you, well, very often I use tungsten uh, TESs, which have a much steeper um, transition, namely with a width of only one or two uh, millikelvin. Uh, and then down here, uh, we can see these noise sources uh, plotted. So the noise power spectra with its components. Um, and we can see that, so this is um, very often observed similarly to uh, this, that for frequencies above um, several hundred hertz, this electrical noise dominates the noise power spectrum, but uh, for lower frequencies, this excess uh, 1 over f noise um, dominates the frequencies. I have here also plotted the noise contribution of a uh, 50 hertz uh, power supply, which is something that we typically also see the noise power spectrum uh, of such measurements. And now, um, having established this kind of theory, we can look at some, uh, we can play a bit with these parameters and reason about uh, what would happen uh, if you would make some small changes um, in the, to, the, to the, the physics of this model. Um, and with that, I want to start with, so I put here this, again, this um, thermal model of our detector again. Uh, and I want to start playing around with these uh, thermal couplings between the heat bath and our superconducting film and the crystal. Uh, and want to ask the question, how, what happens uh, in this device uh, if we increase or decrease the strength of one of these thermal couplings? Um, so uh, this plot is pro probably something that one uh, needs to look at twice or, or digest a bit, but I will guide you through it. Um, so what we see here is a uh, red solid line. This is kind of the device that was originally used in, uh, in the reference. Uh, and this green circle marks the point, um, it marks exactly this detector uh, from the reference. What we have on the x-axis is the thermal coupling between our superconducting film uh, and the heat bath, this is typically realized by some small, um, this is typically shunted by some small gold film or gold wire. Um, and we can, by the density of this film or the, or the length of this wire, we can kind of control strength of this thermal coupling. And we can see that in this original reference, um, the detector was in a type of, uh, it's called a bolometric mode. And what this means is that the thermal relaxation time of the superconducting film, uh, that this is smaller than the thermalization time of the phonons. Uh, so it kind of measures the power that comes in uh, instead of measuring the total energy uh, that is deposited. And uh, by, by um, lowering this strength of thermal coupling of the superconducting film to the heat bath, uh, we also uh, increase the thermal relaxation time of this film until we reach a regime which we call calorimetric mode, where the film kind of collects all the energy of the incoming um, thermalizing phonons uh, before it starts um, releasing this energy back into the heat bath. This is called the calorimetric mode. And most modern devices are operated in this calorimetric mode. So one could say that most modern devices are atermal 
calorimeters. There are a couple of more interesting things um, that, we, that one can um, think about in this plot. Namely, there are also devices that are, um, that are optimized to collect this thermal component of the pulse, so the, the, second, the second pulse component. Um, and for small devices, this can, in fact, reach similar uh, sensitivity um, than, than the R-thermal uh, detectors. This we can see here, but this would be the point with the, um, with the black square uh, on this plot here. Um, of course, you have to, you have to um, optimize this device differently. So for instance, you need a very strong connection between this uh, photonic system and the electronic system. Um, but uh, these devices would scale very differently because this de the sensitivity of such devices would scale um, with the heat capacity of the crystal, um, uh, which especially scales very strongly with temperature and also with the size of the crystal, um, and not with the capability of collecting our thermal phonons from this crystal. And, and to make this a bit more clear, uh, how this scaling would happen, um, I have here a a second plot where I compare exactly these three regimes. So this original R-thermal bolometric mode for this detector from this reference, then the adaption to a R-thermal calorimetric mode, this is the red line here, um, and the black line, which would be an optimized thermal, um, uh, optimized thermal detector. Um, and now we want to look at this absorber and um, of course, it would be beneficial to have a, a target kind of large to collect a larger exposure. But the question that you want to ask now is what, what impact has this on uh, your recoil trash, so your recoil energy threshold? So on the sensitivity of your device. Um, and this is plotted in the right upper plot here. Um, namely, we can see that for a, uh, for this thermal detector, um, the recoil, so the energy resolution, which is proportional to our energy threshold, scales very strongly with the size of our target, um, namely with exactly with the, if the, or approximately with the volume of the target, uh, while the, uh, while the energy resolution scales not as strongly, um, in R thermal, in devices optimized for R thermal phonon collection. Um, so this is one of the reasons why current devices are mostly um, operated in 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 a R-thermal uh, regime uh, because you can scale up this target at least a bit and still reach um, reach relatively low uh, energy thresholds. But also um, what we can see on this plot is to really reach the lowest energy resolutions and thresholds, which is the ultimate goal of a light dark matter source, uh, dark matter search. Uh, we need to just lower this target mass. Um, and this is what is also done in experiments. So current devices are uh, relatively small targets that reach, reach um, low thresholds. Um, and now we can also ask the question, I always talked about now this very low transition, so these devices with these very low transition temperatures. So is this really necessary operating a cryostat at 50 millikelvin or the base temperature of 10 millikelvin or lower? It's of course um, much more uh, much more difficult than operating a cryostat with uh, some 4 kelvin or so. Uh, so we can ask the questions, what would happen if we use the device um, with just a, just a hotter op uh, operation temperature? Um, and what we can see here, if we scale up this temperature, and in this case, only from the nominal value of 20 millikelvin up to 60 millikelvin, we can see a dramatic increase um, of this energy threshold, therefore a dramatic loss of sensitivity. And this is mostly due, due to two reasons, namely um, that this coupling between the uh, electronic and the photonic system which has to be very small for to reach an R-thermal calorimetric mode. This coupling uh, scales extremely strongly with the temperature. So this is the uh, strength of the um, electron phonon interaction that dominates this, this coupling. Um, and this scales with temperature to the power of five. Um, so this calorimetric mode can really only be reached in this uh, at these very, very low temperatures. 
Um, this is the one and major reason um, why these very low temperatures are really necessary. Um, and the other reason is that all these heat capacities, so in the electronic system, the heat capacity scales uh, proportional to the temperature, while in this um, photonic system, the heat capacity scales to the temperature to the power of three. Uh, so in both cases, we see that um, we, we, we significantly lose sensitivity if we would operate these devices uh, at a higher temperature. Okay, with that um, already enough about the, um, about the rigorous theory of these devices, and I want to mention a couple of uh, current research topics. Um, namely, in the past uh, couple of years, devices have reached energy thresholds of a significantly below 100 electron volt. Um, and there appeared something that nobody expected, and that is still a big, big question mark, namely a, a low, so-called low energy excess. And they put here a plot of um, measurements from several different experiments that all measure this phenomenon. Uh, namely, this is an increase, a steep increase in the event rate towards uh, lower energies. Um, and currently, the origin of this effect um, is not known. However, uh, one could now kind of cheer and say maybe we found dark matter, but um, this is very well excluded, the dark matter hypothesis to explain these excesses, um, because this event rate um, is, appears at very different scales uh, in different devices and has one um, characteristic that um, excludes, kind of excludes uh, any uh, external uh, particle origin, uh, namely it um, decays with the time of operation of the device on the time scale of months. Um, so very likely this is a type of detector effect, um, but this is currently a, a limiting factor for the sensitivity of this uh, for, to explain these excesses is some stress effect, for instance, on the crystal thermometer interface. Uh, and there is extensive research done uh, to understand these excesses and uh, manufacture devices uh, that can kind of discriminate these excess events from uh, actual uh, expected dark matter scattering. Uh, there is also a, a workshop um, that deals um, with these successes uh, for a, so a community uh, organized workshop um, to discuss uh, these observations. This is one of the very current uh, research topics um, in, the, in this instrumentation. Um, and before I conclude, I want to mention the relations to other superconducting and quantum technologies. So if we compare now the superconducting thermometers to a different sensor type um, that is kind of prominent in this quantum technologies um, community, namely to superconducting nanowire semi-photon detectors, then we can find quite some similarities. So these uh, SNSPDs, these are small wires um, that are that are deposited on some substrate. Um, and what they do is that uh, if a particle recoils within this wire, then this uh, locally heats up this wire. And the wire is operated similarly to the TS, very close to its superconducting transition. So uh, locally, this um, wire increases. So the temperature of this wire is increased uh, beyond the transition temperature, which again gives a um, uh, which is an effect that is again measurable, uh, therefore gives you one a very sensitive um, device to measure particle scattering. The major difference uh, compared to um, to the superconducting thermometers that are used for dark matter searches is um, that here uh, the sensor itself is the target. Uh, this can give a much stronger sensitivity, um, but also this limits the uh, the exposure that can be collected because this wire, of course, has a um, very low mass. <laughs> I'm sorry. And the second connection to another type of superconducting technology that I want to mention is connection to um, superconducting qubits, um, also called transmon qubits. Um, and an effect that is currently studied in um, these references that I put on the right here um, is that 
um, is to understand these error sources in uh, superconducting qubits. And apparently one of these error sources can come from uh, phonons that um, thermalize in the sensor and therefore break, break quasi particles in the sensor. Uh, and by that um, cause the de uh, decoherence uh, and the error in the in the calculation of this qubit. Um, and this is kind of the same physics that happens uh, for the phonon collectors in uh, TS. So this is was studied in these um, papers here that phonons can can be produced, for instance, uh, from uh, particle recoils or possibly also from these um, stress effects uh, that we call the low energy excess. Okay, with that, I already want to conclude and uh, reach my summary. Uh, cryogenic detectors with superconducting thermometers are currently the most sensitive devices uh, to measure sub-GUV um, dark matter particle scattering. The lowest achieved uh, energy thresholds are only 10 electron volt recoil energy. And the sensitivity of most modern devices is dominated by the capability to collect R-thermal phonons from a target crystal. There are similar challenges in fabrication and background mitigations with other superconducting technologies. And these devices are continuously improved and new, these new phenomena uh, continue to be discovered and the research is done to understand them. For instance, these low energy excess events. Okay, with that I'm done and I'm happy to take any questions now. Uh, thank you very much, Eli. Sorry, I couldn't activate the, the volume. Uh, so thanks a lot. It has been very interesting, really. The, for, for me personally, because I am physicist as well, although I have taken some distance from this. Um, uh, so questions and comments from, uh, from the people. You don't need to raise the hand anymore because uh, you are already there. and We are at the end of the uh, actual presentation. Anybody who wants to start? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Please do. Yes. Okay. Do. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very nice kind of, um, pedagogical talk. Okay. Very, very clear. I think very clear and interesting. So, so I have uh, actually a couple of questions, Felix. Mm -hmm. uh, if I understand, uh, one of the things that you have been showing here is the optimization of the different uh, thermal conductivities between the bath mm -hmm. and and the and the well, and, and the film. That you mm -hmm. the electronic system and the absorber, right? The phonon system, mm -hmm. and uh, and actually you have uh, you are seeing here or you are showing here actually how depending on these parameters, okay, you may have different energy resolutions, quite mm -hmm. different actually. Yeah. Really different. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, <laughs> how can you um, change uh, uh, or manufacture uh, devices? With different values of this uh, for mm -hmm. these conductivities, because uh, I mean, I'm. Um, I think this is kind of tricky, right? Because I don't see how can you tune or or or, or adjust uh, um, those values. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah a, a great question, and and uh, yeah, actually, it is tricky. Uh, but there are ways to uh, to do this. So um, the most crucial quantity here is actually this coupling between the sensor and the bath. Um, and for that, maybe if I go back to one of the pictures of these devices. Um, so usually this coupling has two major components, namely um, one is the, the gold bond. So the wire that leads from the, uh, from the sensor to, um, to, the, to the heat bath. And uh, this you could, so the strength of this thermal coupling, you could, for instance, um, uh, so you, you could put uh, a, a thicker or a thinner wire, uh, or you could make the wire longer or shorter. Um, but uh, in fact, to reach this very, very low uh, values of thermal coupling, you need to additionally um, have a technology to make the, the coupling even weaker, so to kind of shunt um, this coupling. Um, and this is done by putting, I think you cannot properly see it here in the picture, but this is done by putting an extremely thin uh, gold film um, away from the superconducting film here. And by the, the thickness of this film, so this is a, produces a much lower thermal coupling than the coupling of the, the gold bond. Uh, and with the, by controlling the thickness of this film, you can also control the strength uh, of this thermal coupling. And there is some, you, some lower bounds um, where you, you in practice, cannot operate a device anymore if the 
thermal coupling is lower than this because it just won't cool in your cryostat. Uh, but at least in um, ideologically, if you if you manage to 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 uh, manufacture this, you have a, a handle on the strength of this coupling. Um, for the other couplings, uh, it's more tricky um, to to control the strength. Uh, but for instance, if you look at this crystal, you can see a bit that there are um, this. In this case, it's I think it's a copper stick uh, that holds the crystal in place. And so this um, connection between the crystal and the, so the interface of the crystal and this copper stick that holds it in place uh, would be the point uh, that dominates the thermal coupling from the crystal directly to the bath. Uh -huh. uh, and this you could change by, for instance, applying something, some different material for the holding uh, or some different mounting um, structure. Um, and finally, the coupling between the film and the crystal is at low temperatures dominated by the interaction strength of, um, of the electronic and the photonic system. And this is something that scales with the volume of the superconducting film and very strongly with the temperature. So mostly you control this by just trying to reach very low uh, transition temperatures, which then, um, which then makes this electron photon interaction only very weakly and effectively reduces the strength of your thermal coupling. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. This is it was really yeah. It's it's, it's going to be, yeah. It's tricky. It sounds tricky. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it uh, is tricky. Yeah. Try and error. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Okay, I only have time for another question, which is related to that. Or yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. We, okay. No, we, it, it, yeah. just to to clarify one thing because um, you were mentioning uh, a thermal, uh, let's say, but in, in, I think if I understand in you, in two, in two, in two exceptions, let's say, in two concepts, because mm -hmm. you were mentioning the, the the direct detection of a thermal phonons, okay, those mm -hmm. optical phonons, yeah, okay, but also you mentioned uh, a, a thermal in the sense of, um, yeah, please correct me, in the sense that the actual uh, sensing element is is the thin film, right? The the, yes. the capacity of right. the electrons yeah. and not the capacity of, yeah. on, on the phonons, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and then it was unclear to me when you were saying a thermal calorimeter to mm -hmm. which one you were referring to. I mean, it was yeah. unclear. Yeah. Um, okay. This is also a great question. So um, actually, it's okay. Of of course, everything that we measure in the end is temperature. So in the end, everything is, is kind of uh, thermal. Um, and what I mean by, by discriminating between this R thermal component and the thermal component is that um, this, this component, the R thermal component, is, is uh, induced by R thermal phonons. So phonons that are much hotter than the, the typical phonon, um, than the typical phonon energy in the temperature in the, in the thermal uh, phonon distribution. Um, so it's induced by these non-thermal phonons that scatter directly in the uh, sensor and um, induce, a, so it deposit the energy there and induce the temperature increase there. But of course, it's in the end also a thermal in the sense that it's a, it's a temperature increase. Uh, and, and the other component is the one that really, uh, where the thermometer warms up because the, the, temp the actual temperature of the crystal increases. And this is why this is also called the kind of thermal component because it's a really a temperature transfer one that you could uh, calculate, for instance, with the heat equation or so on. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. A great talk. I, I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, so, somebody else? More curiosities, questions, comments, feedback? Uh, it looks like not. Okay, so in that case, uh, before uh, before uh, closing, uh, well, uh, Phil, thank Felix. Uh, we cannot well. clap in a room, <laughs> but feel like uh, yes, we are doing the equivalent. Ah, oh, yeah, I, I see that in the icon. <laughs> thank you, Anastasia. So um, before um, wrapping up, just remind you that uh, for those who just came at the, uh, later in the, in, at the beginning of the talk, that we, uh, we have recorded this presentation, so you can just uh, find it back in a couple of days, um, uh, maximum, in, uh, in the Indico reference. Uh, and also, uh, feel welcome to contact us if you would be interested to do, like Felix has done this morning, uh, in presenting your work on quantum technologies. 
with this, uh, I wish you happy lunch. I look forward to see you in the next event, which is foreseen in two weeks' time. But you will see, you will uh, get all the information about it uh, by mail, by separate mail. So uh, thank you, Felix, and have a nice day, everybody.